on the website for um, yeah so if you want to know a bit more about the faculty um a public health special interest group primary care and public health i put the link in the chat and you can join there the previous webinars are also um up on the faculty um website so you can go in and watch the previous ones and we will put this one up on the, the faculty website as well. So it, it will be in the public domain. It'll be open to anybody to see that recording. So just be a little bit careful about um, what you say. You know, we don't want any uh, patient identifiable information shared uh, in this or in questions. So um, welcome to everybody. We will have two marvelous speakers um, for uh, 20 minutes each. So about 40 minutes and then we'll leave 20 minutes or so for questions at the end. And at one o'clock, we will move on to have a little update on the um, special interest group. And you, nobody has to stay for that, but if you're interested in what we're doing and in future webinars and so on, then please do stay. So, um, Johnny, um, would you like to introduce the speakers or would you like me to do that? Please, could you, Catherine, sorry. Okay, that's fine. Johnny's coping with a five-year-old and, and dodgy sound, but otherwise Johnny would normally be uh, introducing because he's organised these webinars, which is wonderful. So what we're going to um, hear about is um, is trauma and its consequences. Now, if it, from a public health point of view, we can see that a lot of the long-term conditions, misery, premature mortality, that we see at a population level is uh, could be prevented if we could do something about it early on so we could mitigate or prevent the trauma that leads to some of the consequences that we see and as primary care uh, frontline workers we are seeing that and we are witnessing that in adults the consequences of trauma in childhood but we also have a role in recognizing it as it before it happens, as it happens, and being able to prevent and mitigate to avoid some of the long term consequences. And I'm delighted that we've got two speakers with us who are pioneering in, in bringing this um, to the attention of people working in the front line and um, the the science of it and the practicality of how we deal with it. So um, the first speaker is Dr. Sarah Temple, is a GP with a special interest in neurodevelopment. She's the founder of ECAP, which is a consultancy working to improve outcomes into adulthood for children and young people. Um, she runs wonderful resources, which she'll tell you about. So people who are interested to know more then Sarah, maybe you put it in the chat after you've spoken. But yeah. I have to say, it's been a real pleasure to meet you in the last few weeks and to hear about what you're doing. So over to you, Sarah. I'll cut you off after 20 minutes and then I'll introduce you, Jonathan, after that. Thank you. So thank you. So yes, my name's Sarah Temple and I'm really delighted to have noticed that uh, Kate Staveley and Erica Andrews have joined me from Somerset. Uh, we're all three of us GPs in Somerset. And uh, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to involve both of you at some point, either in the small group discussions or at the end of my talk. Um, so uh, just a bit of background, I'm a GP. Um, I've had a long term interest in children's mental health and also in how cycles of intergenerational adversity affect outcomes for children and families. And the social enterprise I set up about 15 years ago uh, is, is the vehicle that I've used to explore that interest. And I bid for a public health funded project through that social enterprise in 2014, together with Bath Spa University. And we were successful in, um, in gaining the contract. And the work that we've been doing in Somerset has been a continuation of that. So in the first instance, we were um, asked to devise a way of enabling staff um, in uh, six, we were KPI'd, or uh, for those of you who don't know what a KPI is, we were given the key performance indicator to work at least six, with at least 60% of staff from schools within the project. So it was heavily schools oriented initially the project. And, um, and we were asked to devise a way that staff could, could talk about emotions with families, with children and families, uh, and in particular about emotions that sit behind difficult behaviours. And so right at the beginning of the project, one of the key outcome measurements 
that were used with uh, exclusions, not just um, permanent exclusions, but temporary exclusions as well, uh, classroom calls, call outs and behavioural incidents in class or in the playground. So you can see that in the first throw of the dice, this project was very schools oriented. But I'm delighted to say that in, in the years since then, we've diversified and we're now multi-agency across the whole of Somerset, including primary care. So uh, just before I go into the PDF that I'm going to share with you, which talks about the most recent project work we've been doing, I'd just like to just um, give you the information that in the initial uh, training, we focused on the application of attachment theory, how you could take the science of attachment theory. I'm talking people like Bowlby, and uh, Michael Rutter and the Romanian infants, that kind of data into children's services. And, and how you could use that understanding to improve outcomes for children and families. And we developed a series of psychoeducation tools, which I'll refer to and which you can look at on our website, Dan Siegel's Hand Model and John Gottman's Emotion Coaching being the core um, psychoeducation tools that we use. OK, so but we did change this after about two or three years. Uh, following feedback from uh, more intensive work that I was doing head teachers around exclusions and what we what I came to realize was that staff on the front line find it really difficult to hold that knowledge or the, the particular framework that attachment awareness tends to use they find it quite hard to hold that in the moment that uh, everybody's getting uh, very stressed by the behaviour of a, of a particular child. And so I, in the piece of work I was doing in detail with um, a particular head teacher, I just uh, threw by them. Well, what do you think? Do you think the data that we've got on adverse childhood experience, and I was referring to the 1998 seminal uh, survey that was led by Anda and Folletti, do you think this data is easier? for uh, you guys to hold in mind when you're in that very stressful situation. And immediately the head teacher felt that indeed this was a better framework. And so we then integrated the uh, uh, um, information about adverse childhood experience into our training. And uh, we showed the documentary Resilience uh, and we talked about various examples of data from the original Ander and Fletcher trial. We've subsequently expanded to talk about what's happening in the UK and, and also in Wales. And it's through the Welsh involvement that I came to realise that the Welsh government have uh, earlier this year put out um, a statement that they don't want the ACE, the Adverse Childhood Experience questionnaire, that's based on 10 questions that were put into that survey by Ander and Fletty to be used in services in Wales. And so at that point, we've sort of had to do a bit of a turn on the spot and we have um, integrated in the science uh, from Centre on the Developing Child at Harvard University. Uh, they use, it's all the same stuff really, but it's a slightly different language. And they talk about a positive, tolerable and toxic stress and how, um, a toxic stress response in a particularly in a in a baby either in utero or in the first two to three years of life uh, links with uh, with uh, physiological changes in the body not only in the laying down of the brain architecture but also in the put the putting together of the immune systems the hormonal systems and genetic expression in other words they talk about how the toxic stress response can alter how cells work together in the body and lead therefore on to uh, um, illness and disease, both mental and physical during childhood and into adulthood. So we've tended to, we've gone with that because um, that is acceptable within the Welsh framework and it, it, le it takes the focus a bit away from the actual ACE questionnaire. Because remember that the data in that seminal study in 1998 is observational data. So it is easy for staff who haven't had the level of training that we've all had in analysing data to misinterpret it and get caught on a cause and effect cycle. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you quickly in because I do realise I've only got 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to take you quickly into the work we've been doing over the last year or so within early years. And uh, so I'm going to run through this PDF very quickly. Uh, and you will all get a copy of this, by the way, so please don't worry about that. Um, 
and yes, just while I'm starting, I have this year written a, a book that sits alongside the project, which um, is available on Amazon, or I'm very happy to send any of you who are interested and would like to see it a free copy if you email me. So, um, the moving, so we're several years down the track with this project. And uh, last year, I was given some money to uh, develop a school readiness pilot, which I um, uh, uh, decided to do in Yeovil because Yeovil is the nearest town to where I live. And there's, uh, as those of you who are here from Somerset will know, there's a significant deprivation. Plus most projects in Somerset tend to get run in Taunton or Bridgewater. And so this was an opportunity really to start doing some work in Yeovil. And we invited three, early year settings to uh, work with us and also the local public health nursing team and one primary care setting. And uh, we, I ran the training, the um, we now call it All Emotions Are OK training uh, with the staff online. Everything was online because obviously this was during the pandemic. And um, actually, I'll just put that onto full screen. So I think that might be easier to see. Am I right? I think it probably is easier to see. Um, um, am I right, Catherine? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes thanks. Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. So, so anyway, long and short of it is we did the training online, everything online, every, absolutely everything about this was done online. And then uh, what I did is say to the settings and the public health nursing team and the primary care setting, if you notice a, fam a child in your setting who you think is having emotional difficulties such that they may find it difficult to settle into a reception, uh, then please uh, talk to them about the work we're doing and offer them access to this school readiness pilot. And I developed an online form which the staff could easily access with the family. It's a very much a family-based thing. So the uh, referral was because of the emotion, the noticed emotional difficulty in the child, but it was for the, but it was the adult caregivers who were engaged with me, not the child. I didn't meet any of the children at all. And because I was really clear that I didn't need any more information than that, we were able to avoid any GDPR issues. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just run through with you now uh, a bit of the basics of, of what happened with that. Uh, pilot and so it was a combination of myself I am I am a GP but I'm also a trained coach uh, Lucy Benny who's a local counsellor and coach and has done a lot of work with me and Liz Peacock who's uh, tuning into teens sorry tuning into kids facilitator this is a an, a, an Australian parenting program uh, where they use the same scientific research as we do in terms of John Gottman and Dan Siegel and we engaged with 18 families in total so all the families were given access to our online resources and they were all emailed a PDF version of my book. In addition, we gave hard copies of the My First Emotions board books to the families and also to the settings. My First Emotions uh, are um, a set of publications that have been put together by uh, Dr. John Lambie, who's a researcher, psychologist and researcher at Anglia Ruskin University. And they've been published through Skylark Learning, if any of you are interested in looking at them. Um, they're, they're very well researched. And again, they're on, they're using the same science that emotion validation, emotion regulation uh, that, that we are using. So um, early years settings of public health nurses were invited to on uh, invited to online shared learning opportunities throughout the project and received a full set of the My First Emotions resources. And in addition to this, we, I have an independent evaluator called Antoinette Davy, who's based at Exeter University, and I've used her right from the beginning of this project to support the collection of data. So obviously, because this is a national forum, we can't really share with you the detail of the data that we collected from this project. But um, in essence, the what we did find in conclusion was that um, only in three out of the 18 cases were families or adult caregivers within the families receiving effective emotional effective support for both emotional and mental health needs that they had. And only, and only three of that 18 were even aware that talking therapies existed. 
So, um, it, so really what came out of this at, at a level was that although staff, uh, and I'm talking at all levels, this is GPs, paediatricians, uh, public health nurses, earlier staff who were involved with these different families, although everyone had noticed that the child was having emotional difficulties, there seems to be some kind of difficulty in linking that with uh, the adult caregiver mental and emotional health needs and uh, and so so one of the first things of course that we've done is try to look at that and this year we're running where well, I'm going to be uh, funded to devise a coaching program where we help to build the skills up in workers in all of these settings to notice that parents are struggling with their emotional and mental health needs. Because we know that where parents have emotional and mental health difficulties, they're likely to have emotional literacy difficulties and no great surprise then that the children have emotional literacy issues. I'd just like to flag up here uh, before we go on that uh, there is a national um, serious case review that's been published very recently that looks at the impact specifically of male adult caregiver emotional dysregulation on outcomes for babies under one. I've put the link in here embedded into here so when you get the pdf if you click that text you'll be able to go straight through to it but they're basically um, actually reinforcing everything that we found in our project work around the fact that the emotional um, intelligence, emotional literacy levels of the parents are, are not being noticed and they're not being managed or supported with uh, developing their emotional literacy. We based all of our work on families, not just on the mother. That article also brings out the fact that a lot of services are focusing too much on mum and, and not perhaps enough on dad. So I thought simplest, because we've got a short time, to read through a case study that. Um, uh, that Antoinette gathered for us. So Antoinette rang a selection of the families that we've been working with and had telephone consultation with them, just talking through how they, what they felt about what we were doing. And so I'm going to read this for you. So in this case study, mum said, we're able to go, we were able to go through it all with Sarah. A lot of what she, my daughter, does triggers me quite badly and I'm having to work on my emotion regulation as well as hers. So we're trying to do it together. We have personally quite a lot going on family-wise outside, so I was in a pretty low state of mind. Sarah provided a copy of the My First Emotions board book and I found that really helpful. My daughter relates to them quite well. If she has a sort of bit of a meltdown, I try my best to get her to sort of come and sit down and then we read through the books. And then she'll pick out what's happening in the story and then we try to relate it back to what has happened or what she might have been able to do. The, her mum said that the assessment was thorough and, they, and uh, they talked about both her background and her partner's background. The guilt and emotional baggage coupled with their backgrounds brought up a lot of emotions, but they found that Sarah was so supportive and compassionate and understood where they were coming from. During the sessions with Sarah, both parents were able to determine that there were chunks of emotion regulation that were missing when we were children and that we have to reparent ourselves now. So this is that creation of that awareness. And Sarah put it in perspective and explained how we would react and why would we react the way we did and to rethink around it and to explain what's going on in her, the daughter's head and to respond more compassionately. And that's principally using the two psychoeducation uh, tools that I was talking about before, Dan Siegel's hand model and John Gottman's emotion coaching, as well as the positive tolerable toxic stress model from Harvard. So absolutely all of these families, I spent time talking through the uh, what the toxic stress response is, how uh, scientifically, in, in, in a way that they were able to understand and engage with it. So mum accessed the resources that Sarah had suggested and found the science behind emotions interesting, but found that Sarah explained it in layman's terms and consolidated the learning. The e-learning was found to be useful in explaining the concepts and the exercises were useful, useful. However, the difficulty is finding the headspace to be able to take things in. The mixture of things, the videos that you can dive in, which explains things and the different articles and reading other people's viewpoints has been useful. Uh, there, and, and mum here commented, there's a dearth of information available to parents. However, the, uh, however, the um, difficulty is finding the right sort resources that will be supported to parents. I mean, I think it is sometimes, you know, well, it's interesting, isn't it, to hear what parents uh, say, because we may think we put a lot there on the internet, but they're not always accessing it. 
so finally I spent most of my childhood repressing all of my emotions and putting things in boxes that was difficult to deal with I don't want my daughter having to do that or not thinking she can't come and talk to us that's my determining factor I've been through various bits of therapy in the past. Immediately, I felt at ease with her, Sarah, and I felt like a hallelujah moment that someone understands. It would be a huge benefit to anybody and everybody to have access to this. So, um, so, so you know, when we had more feedback, I just thought that one uh, quote might be helpful in setting the context for this. And I'll just forward us through the PDFs that you can see. And then uh, I'm just then going to look at the learning we took from this, which is that um, uh, that that we need to get really better. Obviously, all of us at noticing that children's emotional difficulty, but then also linking that with parental or adult caregiver well-being. Don't forget that it's not always the biological parents. Uh, in fact, often it isn't, or might only be one, might be one biological parent. So we use the term adult caregiver. And, um, and what we found is that staff really need some tools to be able to even begin to have conversations along the line of how are you with mum or dad. And so we put together a short video clip, which is three minutes long and funded through Talking Therapies, which is the, the branch of, uh, you know, the uh, IAPT Improving Access to Psychological Therapies project in Somerset. And um, a mum there, Vicky, has talked about her experience of accessing emotional uh, mental health support through IAP. So we're hoping to break down the barriers in terms of uh, parental and adult caregiver awareness of what talking therapies can offer by taking videos straight into early years settings, directly accessing parents. So that is on their websites, uh, Facebook pages, and also when uh, staff are what we we're encouraging is a move toward when staff are talking with families about any kind of emotional or behavioural difficulty that their child is having, that it becomes normal to also give access to that video clip. Um, and we're also trying to access funding to have a much greater availability of the uh, My First Emotions board books, because what we know now is that those parents and adult caregivers who are really struggling, really struggling with their own emotional world or emotion regulation, which is often related to intergenerational adversity, uh, actually it's difficult for them to even know what an emotion validating um, interaction with their child is. So it's not enough for me or anyone else to say uh, well, you need to be more uh, using an emotion coaching relationship style, they actually need to have quite a lot of support in developing their own emotion literacy. And this book actually kind of shortcuts that because it gives them an example of emotion valid ways of talking with children that are emotion validating. Uh, so that's worked really well. We're integrated with the Oxford University adult um, psychiatric team have now uh, also taken on the Harvard Center on Developing Child Research, which is obviously massively validating for us. And they have put together a, a free website with free and uh, masses of free resources at oxfordbrainstory.org. They are offering um, free webinar training for frontline staff, and we are really trying hard to engage Somerset with that. I'm starting the training, I'll be two minutes, Catherine. I'm starting the training this year for the, um, as I mentioned before, putting together this coaching program that we hope will enable uh, staff to have to have more effective conversations with adult caregivers. And that is, we're calling it the advanced practitioner training. And, you know, in the end, uh, in my view, you know, we've been at this a long time, but I put together my social enterprise about 15 years ago. And finally, I feel we're really moving now into an opportunity for joined up person centred commissioning across health and care and education. So I'm actually feeling very positive about this at the moment. And I that's probably a good way to finish. So thank you, Catherine. I'm aware you're flagging me up there for the 20 minutes. <laughs> Spot on, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, that, no worries. You, I'll just, yeah. You, that's uh, excellent. Thank you. There's, kind of telling a personal story is it really gets us to understand doesn't it and then you mentioned a lot of resources Eleanor has put a couple in the chat there um but if you uh, if you hang around Sarah if you could put a few in the chat and also yeah. send any to me so that um everybody who's registered for this Johnny and I can send the slide sets around and the pdfs around and also any resources that you think might be helpful 
Uh, sure. People, yeah, I can do that. They're all online, so um, it's fairly straightforward accessing them. So I'll put the I'll put the links up while Jonathan's talking. Brilliant. That's great. Um, can I ask people to hold questions in their heads, but better still to put them in the chat um, so that we can gather them together and um, put them to the two speakers at, at the end. So, Jonathan, would you like to switch your camera on and unmute yourself? Um, I'm delighted that Jonathan can join us. I don't think we, we haven't met before, um, so uh, hopefully this we, we will meet again after this. Um, Jonathan Thomas is a GP in Hackney in East London. Um, you're a trustee of the Centre for Health and the Public Interest. Um, and I've just had a look at your website, very interesting reports and, and um, policy work there. And um, I was interested that you described yourself as having a special interest in poverty medicine, shame, trauma and education. So I've not heard that phrase poverty medicine before, but for those of us interested in public health and primary care, that's that's quite a concept. We, we might, maybe if you could explain what you mean by that, but the floor is yours, Jonathan. Um, thanks very much. Um, I, I, have, I have a few, very few slides um, and I'd, I'd probably just begin with a, a story about how I got interested in this subject. So uh, I'm, I've been a GP in the same practice for 20 nearly 20 years um, with a couple of uh, forays and time out. And the, the being in one place for 20 years is a really important part of understanding continuity of care. Uh, well, understanding the importance of continuity of care in getting your head around what trauma uh, does to people. So to, to give a, a very present example, um, one of the, my patients who helps me teach uh, students came in this week and he's, he's fantastic for, for helping with teaching because he has so much wrong with him. Um, he has about 12 different long-term conditions uh, and he's on about, 24 different regular medications and he attends um, four or five uh, regular hospital uh, outpatient departments and a huge part of his life is dedicated to managing all of these conditions and dealing with the medications and putting up with side effects and having acute uh, exacerbations uh, and his conditions include rheumatoid arthritis, um, both Crohn's disease and uh, ulcerative colitis. The, the diagnosis keeps changing from one to the other. Um, hypertension, restless legs, obstructive sleep apnea, um, and more. And he has, uh, his skin is very inflamed and sort of flares up from time to time. Uh, he also suffers with um, depression, which can be very severe at times. And one of, you're probably aware of the, the, the cartoon with the, the drunk guy who's looking for his keys at night under a street lamp and the policeman comes along and asks um, what he's doing. And the guy says, oh, I'm looking for my keys. And um, the policeman said, so, so did you drop them here? And the guy says, no, 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 I dropped them way over there, but this is where the light is. And I think that's a good example of, of modern medicine. So with, with the patient I described, people tend to look in their own specialist fields to find the answer to the question, of why does this patient have this particular disease? And seen in isolation, what you don't recognize is this constellation of multiple um, autoimmune and inflammatory conditions with significant mental health and other functional neurological or unexplained symptoms. And I've had the opportunity to, to have a relationship with this guy for, for at least 15 years um, as his own doctor. And through, throughout that, you know, general practice is often described as ultra brief encounters over an ultra long amount of time. So it's ultra brief and ultra long. And what you develop in that time is not just a knowledge of, of your patient, but is, is trust and a safe environment. And trust and safety are 
the first and most important kind of aspect of what we I would now describe as trauma informed care, but it just seemed like good general practice uh, at the time. And over the years of, of meeting this guy and, and talking about his conditions, we've asked the question, as all patients do, why me? Why have I got so much wrong with me? And if you take a kind of biomedical lens, you might be looking at kind of genes or genetic predisposition. Now, this guy doesn't know because he was adopted, so he doesn't know his family history. Um, but what we do know is that his mother uh, was 15 years old when he was born, and she was already uh, very mentally unstable herself and already using drugs and alcohol. Uh, we also know that he was um, adopted uh, and then sent away to school at an early age. So having been abandoned by one mother, he was abandoned uh, by his adoptive family. And we also know that he suffered sexual abuse and bullying at school. And we also know, because we've done some work together, that the first episodes of inflammatory bowel disease started around about the same time as the sexual abuse uh, started. And I now know that having had discussions with other patients who have similar constellations of autoimmune inflammatory diseases, um, functional neurological symptoms, chronic pain and mental health problems, including um, self-harm and suicidal behavior, but without any exception that I know of, they've all suffered very significant childhood trauma. But it's only because I have this very special position of um, being a doctor in an established practice with very good continuity of care. I can provide the kind of safe environment uh, that enables me to get to know patients on this level. Um, and on the core, on the wall behind me, just where I'm pointing, you can see um, the Incredible Hulk stood underneath uh, a picture that says stay present. Uh, and the Incredible Hulk is a good example of um, a trauma response called dissociation. So I'm just going to share a handful of slides um, now. And... Here we go. So the, the model that, that I use, which I find helpful with patients is called the, the trauma world. And, and you can see dissociation, which is, is what happens when Bruce Banner becomes triggered and then dissociates into the character of the Hulk. But the trauma world is, is best described as something that happens inside of you as a result of what happened to you. Um, so when we, are talking about trauma, we're not actually talking about the events uh, that occurred. And I, I'm talking about adults who, who I deal with most of all, but we're not talking about what happened to you when you were growing up, although that might be important uh, to know, to help, to make sense of things. But actually we're talking about what's happening within the person and the symptoms are suffering at the moment. And the commonest presenting symptoms are of hyper arousal. So anxiety, agitation, and overactive systems. So gastrointestinal, you would see with people with irritable bowel syndrome, irritable, irritable bladder, and urinary and fecal incontinence when it's particularly severe. Um, but also, as I've described, autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. People that easily uh, become irritable or have panic attacks uh, or tend to flip into, into a kind of rage, uh, like the Hulk. Um, hypo arousal would be the opposite. So people who describe feeling numb or having so what we might describe as alexithymia, so lacking any, any feelings whatsoever. Um, exhaustion and chronic fatigue. And you can see already this, this mixture of hyper and hypo arousal, physiological and emotional, uh, uh, symptoms begin to describe some of the people who are also triggered um, by 
experience of COVID um, and have prolonged or persistent symptoms. Uh, and some of these, by all means, not all, but some of them, the, the experience triggers um, something, uh, you know, a pre-existing tendency. Toxic shame is, is, is incredibly important. So toxic shame is, is the belief that you somehow brought this upon you. So the way a child would make sense of, of being abused rather than it, than kind of dealing with the reality that the person who was supposed to love and care for them has done something awful and has betrayed them and abused them and taken advantage of them. We've rationalized this by blaming themselves and saying, well, it must have been something about me that resulted in this happening. Or if not, it must have been something that I should have done that should have stopped this. And that sense of sort of self-blame persists into, into adulthood. And the way that trauma can present with patients is in a sense of um, it's all my fault or I'm not worth it, which results in self-neglect, self-harm and suicide. Uh, dissociation is, is, is another word for functional neurological symptoms. Uh, and one thing that's really important, I, I suppose we're mostly talking about historical traumatic events that result in present day traumatic symptoms. But actually, it's, it's been my experience that it's very common to see patients who have dissociative symptoms, who are presently experiencing domestic violence or other intimate vi partner violence. Uh, and in young people or children who are presently being abused. And what I find very concerning, uh, and I would warn uh, you all to be concerned about, is an, an insistence from, from many neurologists I've come across um, that dissociation and abuse are not related or that the associations are exaggerated. Um, I, I don't hold the view that they are exaggerated. And I do hold the view that if you don't investigate um, the possibility that they are presently um, ongoing, then you're failing in your duty of care. Um, and I can think of at least two patients I'm looking after at the moment who presented with dissociative symptoms as well as with severe anxiety and um, severe irritable bowel and uh, other symptoms. But dissociation is definitely part of the presentation who were being abused but didn't dare to tell me and I think for both of them it was between for one it was about six months and the other one it was about two years of seeing her regularly to try to help with the you know she's seeking symptom symptomatic treatment um, but it then there was a bit of confrontation I remember one of them telling me that her husband was an alcoholic um, and she was being abused and, and I'm very happy to say uh, now, about 18 months on from that event, um, she's now in a place of safety and, and they've separated um, and her dissociative symptoms have completely resolved. Um, and finally, is, is on the little finger is coping, which is often another way people present and that's with addictive behavior. So coping is about symptom control. How do you control hyper arousal? Well, you want to sedate yourself. So one way you could work out as a public health specialist or as a GP is look, search your medical records for everybody on sedative medication. And I guarantee that 80% of them will be experiencing you know, a constellation of dissociative hyperarousal, hyperarousal, and toxic shame symptoms. Uh, in other words, they are trying to cope with the trauma world. And so as Gabo Mate says, instead of saying why the addiction, you should ask why the pain. Um, the, the, the next slide I have is, is just to illustrate with the Hulk. So he stands in the corner of my room uh, and a lot of people um, relate to the Hulk. And interestingly, a lot of the people, um, and when people do relate to it, it's often when you tell them the story, so that the slides on the right show his dad is a violent alcoholic beating him and his mum as a baby. So that was his, his traumatic childhood. Um, and interestingly, people see the, the, the model of the Hulk in my room and say, and laugh and say, gosh, that's just like me. And I, and I say, 
well, you know, the story of the Hulk, and then they look at it and then they say, that was my childhood. Um, that's incredibly common. Um, but having the Hulk there is, is, is kind of a, a way in to, to help people, you know, almost humorously dis describe a very dark subject. Um, so, so what do I say to, to GPs? So I do a lot of work training GPs, GP trainees and medical students. Um, I encourage them to look at the patterns. If you're seeing a mixture of hyperarousal, hypoarousal, toxic shame, dissociative symptoms and coping strategies, think, um, think trauma. Um, and, you know, join the dots. Once you've seen uh, trauma, you can't unsee it. It's like if you look at night sky and you see constellations, you can't look up and just see stars again. You, you, you always see the cons constellations there. Um, and, and so I would estimate that um, about 60% of every normal GP surgery I do involves looking after patients suffering from this. It's, it's that prevalent. And I do work in a deprived practice, inner city practice, and I have been a GP there for a long time. So, so maybe I see more of it. Um, but the fact that I'm making these associations all the time means um, that I'm acutely sort of sensitive to it. Um, what do we do about it? An absolutely crucial uh, question. I have this um, uh, slide as a picture on my wall, um, a sort of painted version. Um, and, and the thumb has got social security because that wraps around everything else and is often forgotten when people take a, a medical view. So the, the medical view normally starts at the wrong end, which is the little finger, which is dealing with stuff in your mind. So people think trauma, they need therapy. Actually, that's the least important thing. So that's why it's deliberately on the little finger. Social security means safety, but that can happen within the GP surgery. But it also means housing, personal safety, financial security. Uh, and it's really important that we advocate for social and personal security and safety. Human relationships are undoubtedly, um, you know, the, the area that's been shown to be most um, nurturing and helpful and human connection is really how trauma is healed. And it's through relationships with other people, not, not with me, but, but with other people in the world around them, uh, that, that, that trauma is most likely to be healed. But they need the secure base in order to start working on those relationships. Biology, what goes in your body, the, the, the enormous amount of interest and research into the effect of diet and the microbiome and how that affects mental, physical, uh, immunological and inflammatory processes um, that are going on is, is really fascinating. And, and what we need to do is, is to find ways of making that accessible to people who are living on a low income um, and, and dealing with deprivation at the same time. Um, it's got to be diets for the masses, not for the, the goji berry uh, few. Uh, what you do with your body is, is vital. I have a friend, Betson, who does therapeutic knitting for chronic pain, um, and she calls it bilateral rhythmic trauma therapy, um, which I love. Um, and I'm, I'm especially interested in, in new research showing the benefits of weight training uh, on mental health and immune function so that weight training your muscles release endogenous cannabinoids and myokines uh, which uh, moderate the effects of pain uh, and inflammation um, and there's a fantastic podcast called Jerry's on Ice about weight training for old people uh, which is so inspiring and um, it's really changed my kind of view of, of, of exercise. Uh, and it should be fun, social uh, and, and necessary. Uh, and last of all, mind, I won't go into because that's what everybody talks about, um, the trauma. Um, validation and vindication is what you as a clinician do with the patient in front of you. So you believe them uh, and you say, you know, I, I know that you probably blame yourself for this, but it's not your fault. Um, finally, um, being trauma aware and trauma focused and delivering trauma informed care is, is emotional labour. Um, so you do need to take care of yourself and everything that's good for looking after patients is also good for us. So I spend, I do meditation every morning. Um, I, I'm very careful about my diet. Um, I'm, I'm recovering from multiple fra fractures after being hit by a car six weeks ago. 
Um, if you saw my x-rays uh, of my smashed right collarbone, which is re re behaving with surgery, you, you wouldn't believe I was still standing here. But um, I focus very hard on my own salutogenesis, uh, which is the science of what it is to be, to be well and be hopeful with patients because people do recover from trauma all the time, um, but they often feel hopeless. Um, so that's so important. Uh, and far from finding these patients you know, super frustrating. Um, I now stand in awe at the trauma that they carry rather than, stand, rather than standing in judgment at the way they carry it. Uh, so I'm in my 20 minutes and I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That's um, very emotional. And, and I think many people listening will have, will recognize the story that you tell and then the interpretation you put on it and just made me think in because I was a GP in Liverpool in the prior part of Liverpool for many years and the, the people that you're describing there that the way that they're dealing with trauma the number of consultations where I'd kind of think is today the day that this person is going to tell me about it because you know that there is something there you just absolutely know it it's just Sometimes it takes years and years and years for somebody to tell you. And I'm really interested that you said, well, therapy is the smallest part of it. That's not what really matters. Because that, because it never did seem to make much difference when somebody told their story. It was other things that were then the next step, not therapy, not messing about with, you know, digging into the, the underlying causes and emotions. So I'm really interested in what you're saying. Uh, I, think, I think we've got some questions. I just respond quickly to that. I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, my experience is, is therapists, you know, when I was over the years, have said, you know, the, the doctor was stuck with this patient for years. They didn't know what's wrong with them. They kept going back with their terrible, unexplained symptoms. And then we had this amazing breakthrough and they told me about the terrible thing that happened and I hypnotized them and it all came back. And, and then magically the scales fell away and the symptoms got better. Um, but that might happen, that might happen, but I've never, <laughs> I've never seen it happen. And I think therapists get this kind of overvalued idea about the power of therapy because all the people for whom therapy doesn't work continue to visit their GP week in, week out. So we, we, we see all the people who are sort of stuck with their symptoms and, and you know, and, and, and the successes we, we probably forget about, um, you know, and, and they're, they're few and far between. So a lot of what we do is holding uh, work and, and supportive, you know, with, with all their long-term conditions. Absolutely, that's absolutely. Well, the first question that, that came up, which kind of follows on from that is, um, how do you mainstream this approach? Now, you, you, the two of you have, have um, you know, it's embedded in your day-to-day -day practice. How do we, um, mainstream across all frontline services, but particularly in primary care. Um, do, 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 I, do I want me to start? Yeah, but, but you, if, Jonathan, yeah. if you start, and then if Sarah has okay. something to add, we've, we've only got about 10 minutes left, okay. so maybe so, you don't have to answer every no, no. question. So, so very, very briefly, it's, it's an approach that you need to have with absolutely every patient and every clinical interaction. You can't just switch it on for somebody who you think might have trauma, because you never know. Like it, it could be anyone and everyone. So, so first of all, it just needs to be like medicine. It shouldn't have trauma-informed medicine and medicine. It just should, that's what medicine should be like. And it needs to be organizational and institutional. Um, in other words, everybody in your organization, from the receptionist that write the letters describing all the awfulness, uh, to the receptionists who deal with the aggression and, and irritability, um, everybody needs to be um, to understand this stuff. Um, yeah, that's my yeah. So can I add to that? I think it's really interesting and uh, it's fantastic today to have Jonathan present you presenting alongside me because I think what we're saying is the same, but we use really different language. And so I'll just I'm going to say exactly what you've just said, but I'm going to use a different way of saying it. And so what we say in, a, oh, I do need to be on the video screen though, because uh, we, I use my hands a lot. So um, what I say is when we're looking at being inclusive, 
with neurodiversity, including that neurodiversity that we know is caused by intergenerational adversity. So that effect on that early brain architecture that we're talking about, the toxic stress response effect on early brain development. When we're looking at being inclusive with that across the whole of primary care and in fact all other services, we mostly talk about this with schools, then really you need to provide, you need to devise a program that like, sits like that. So where you're devising something that is it works with the whole population. Now what we find uh, is happening a lot both in any service but particularly in health and education is that uh, programs are devised, well-being programs in particular, that are actually devised for that for, uh, for those part that part of the population that have a typical neuro uh, neurological profile. So that in other words it's not inclusive with neurodiversity that's sitting here. So what we're saying is we need to find ways of, of talking about and managing children in schools or, 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 or anyone in primary care using programs that are universal, that are inclusive for the whole population and move away from that model where we have a targeted approach for those children who've experienced trauma. And Jonathan, I think we're saying exactly the same thing. A slightly different way of saying it. Thank you. Um, Eleanor, no, my co-chair of the SIG, Eleanor, is also uh, is going to be looking at some of the questions. Is there a question that that um, you've noticed, Eleanor, that you'd like to highlight to put next? Actually, just before Eleanor does that, Catherine, can I just respond to uh, Jonathan to your comment about therapy as well? Because again, I think we're saying the same thing, but we're coming from it slightly differently. So what we have in Somerset anyway, within the talking therapies, which is the improving access to psychological therapies piece of work here, is actually work that is about improving functionality. So when we're referring families who are having difficulty with em their emotional intelligence, which is affecting the emotional uh, development of their children, they're being referred for uh, support in, in developing that emotional literacy so that they can be more, more functional as parents. It is not, I think when you were talking about therapy, you were meaning uh, them going and having actual therapy for their, the way they're talking about their adversity, I think. Whereas what we're talking about is access to, to support. That means that, that families, adult caregivers in family settings are able to function more effectively. But in this county, it is called talking therapies. So it's a bit confusing. They have separate projects. One, um, pro they have the functionality project, which is short term offer and then they have a longer term thing for more in-depth therapy which I think is the bit you were referring to Jonathan am I right? Jonathan, yes it, yeah yeah no I yes I, I agree but I think you've got to you know you've got to use all the other things there's a picture on my wall I'm pointing at it with the hand um, and it's opposite where patients sit and they quite often say what's that and I have some postcards in my drawer and we can talk about them together and sometimes you feel too overwhelmed to do one part of that, or sometimes there's something missing. Thank Eleanor, you. Hi, yeah. Eleanor from Bermuda. So, <laughs> so glad you <laughs> join us. Uh, it's pouring with rain, and uh, I'm working on COVID here. But yeah, anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I, I personally loved the, um, yeah, absolutely loved the presentations. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm just trying to draw together a few of the questions because I know we're, we're coming towards the end, but um, there, were, there was a question about uh, compassion fatigue um, and, and how we, um, uh, basically how, how, we, how we respond to that with burnout, high burnout levels, huge workloads in primary care um, and, and uh, personally, I've, I've, you know, I think well, I've probably all spirit experienced, um, experienced that being quite. I've, I've, I've been quite shocked by the way people talk about people when they, even when they know they've, they've experienced great trauma and adversity, um, and, and I suppose then how the broader system um, fails to, to serve and provide relational continuity, which can re-traumatize patients um, and, and the kind of off tick box um, referral. Uh, exercises we all engage in can can also be unhelpful can we just have your comments on those thank you that's, that's so impossible like it's they're the biggest questions in primary care at the moment um i, I don't know what to say in a, in a minute i do i mean that people choose to go into healthcare for, for a whole load of reasons but quite 
prevalent among those reasons is their experience of caregiving in early life um, for somebody else. And, and another one is because of not being cared for and having to, to kind of put aside your own needs for care in childhood. Um, and, and I very, very frequently see people who are struggling or, or among the, the first to kind of suffer what you might call burnout or compassion fatigue, are people who didn't have that secure um, start in life and have managed by various means of being, um, you know, extremely resilient in many, many other ways to, to cope up to this point. And so it's interesting that, you know, it often brings up stuff that hadn't been dealt with before when they're, they're really stressed and, and working in a kind of trauma informed way, just like having children shines a light on your own childhood, working with patients who've suffered children trauma shines a light on your own, um, you know, unresolved issues. And, and, and I think there's a lot more sort of good self care that we need to do. And it's, the system is, is awful, but it, it's, it's not just about the system. Thank you. So I'm aware it's now one o'clock. Uh, if you two are happy to carry on for another 10 minutes, because such a fascinating area and there's lots of questions and debate going on in the chat. I, are you two OK to do another 10 minutes um, and take another couple yeah. of questions? Yeah. yeah, sure. Did you want to pick that one up, Sarah, or should we go to? Yeah, I mean, again, I think we we principally are saying say the similar thing. And uh, of course, uh, lots of so all of our training starts with developing uh, when we're working in any area, not just health, but also education and care and increasingly also police services and prison services around developing the uh, emotional intelligence in the worker and also and developing their awareness of their own emotional world. And, you know, that uh, using the hand model from Dan Siegel, we, I'll just have you got time for me to show the hand model very briefly? Because it's really, I find very useful yeah. with staff with burnout. I think it's very useful. So yeah, if you can, you can share your screen again. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, well, I can. Can you see me on the full screen now while I'm talking? Uh, no. Okay. I, I've, I can see lots and lots of people. Go to speak everybody with you. chooses their own view. Yeah. Go to uh, but if if people choose, yeah, you can yeah, choose. Yeah. I think it's easier just to choose. Okay. Me on if the you view. choose speak of you, then yeah. Yeah, if everybody chooses speak of you. Yeah, okay. So what um, this is Dan Siegel's uh, psychoeducation tool. So please don't go away thinking that I made this up because I didn't. I don't want to take credit for that. And also there's a whole load of copyright stuff on it. So, uh, but what, it's really nice metaphor because it's really easy to do. So what he's saying is that when uh, the bra our brains are working at their most effective, then the, uh, the then it can be modeled with the hand with the fist closed like that. And in that model, the uh, spinal cord is coming up the back and then you have the brain stem here with the uh, downstairs rep brain representing the limbic system, the emotion centers, and then the upstairs brain representing the prefrontal cortex or the thinking parts. And uh, when all of those parts are connected, we function at our most effective. And when we're having conversations, if both of us, everybody who's... Um, you know, uh, communicating, connecting, has their lid down and will make the most effective group decisions. But we can, uh, some, some of us, and in particular, those who've experienced that toxic stress response, either in that particularly vulnerable critical period very early on or later in childhood, uh, then uh, they can be more reactive. And in that instance, the uh, downstairs brain will become activated more readily when exposed to stress. The lid will start to flap and then it can flip. And when the lid flips, that's when we can say and do things which we wouldn't normally do. And the lid flipping is a representation of being overwhelmed by any emotion. So the obvious one is anger, because, you know, in a school setting, that's where you see the child throwing the chair across the room or something. But it may equally well be sadness or anxiety or um uh, you know, and uh, one of those other emotions, uh, number of, you know, but the issue around it is that at that point, the brain is not working effective. And that's a kind of model, if you like, for what happens in burnout. I know it's completely simplistic, but 
actually it can be really useful to have these really simple metaphors to hold in mind when you're in the moment because of course that can represent disassociation which we know happens with burnout or hypervigilance which can happen with burnout does that make sense absolutely that's i found that quite helpful <laughs> the hand <model. laughs> yeah yeah I mean, I mean, something it's, it's, simple and visual to explain um yeah. i'm just trying to get another couple of questions in uh, 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 trying to amalgamate what people are asking. One is um, somebody asked about, should we not just restart sure start centres and that kind of approach, you know, in public health, we're always saying that we did parenting skills classes for every parent and sure start and those universal um, services that, that had a trauma informed approach. Do you think that's the way to go? Um, shall I take this one first? John thinks it's my field probably. Are you happy with that? Yeah, yeah, only that, of course, you need to really go back and look at the evidence base for improved outcomes for children and families from the way we were doing Sure Start, and it's not as robust as you might think. Uh, it's worth looking at troubled families uh, data and particularly the recurrent updates. Uh, I mean, it's a big conversation as to why that data shows what it does, which I'm very happy to have with anyone. I can take a lot longer than this meeting. But suffice it to say that the ongoing recurrent problem really with the families who become, who, who are supported, but then, then fall back again is mental health difficulties in the adult caregivers. And that is often related to experienced adversity, whether you call it adverse childhood experience or toxic stress response in childhood. That is a very brief summary, but uh, the data isn't as good as you might be thinking. Yeah, it's the way it's done. Um, Paquita, you've put your hand up, but you put lots in the chat as well. So would you like to, to come in and ask your question? You're on mute. Yeah, I'm Please. unmuted. Um, I mean, about the short start, no, I agree that, but what I'm saying is if you incorporated your models, um, successful models and evidence based more into a, a kind of short start program, that's all I'm saying so that it could be scaled up yeah. More so it's key to, yeah, that's that's really, I suppose, what a big part of the work that I'm doing yeah. with public health here in Somerset is exactly. looking at what it is that isn't working, sure. and what what is working first, obviously, and then sure. what isn't working, and what we can do differently. And yeah. a big problem that we've got that we haven't solved is, as Jonathan was referring to earlier, the experienced adversity in our staff. Which, yeah. and don't forget in early year settings, in short sure start settings, we're sure. talking about very low paid staff, a yeah. lot of whom have experienced adversity themselves and haven't had the opportunity sure. that oh, all yes. of us have had to that. resolve that or to process it. And it can be a major block uh, because, the, because the families, these families we're talking about, uh, you know, these emotions, these emotions are really difficult and very triggering. And once the staff are triggered, they go into judgment. Oh and yeah, no, of course. And uh, then, yeah, so that's yeah, a big I mean, hurdle. I would include training and, and support for staff, absolutely. Mm. So I'm not contradicting you there. Yeah, it's, but it is a big conundrum because in this country that we are using, uh, you know, um, we need, I think personally, really what I'm saying at the moment is I think we need more involvement uh, by psychologists and staff who are at a much higher level of analytical thinking uh, who can perhaps who can manage staff on the ground who are using psychoeducational tools but I think is I don't personally think it's ever going to work asking staff who have um, basically NVQ force training to be doing the level of analysis that we're expecting them to do. Sure <clears throat> yeah and no, I, I take your point. Yeah. I think I you're, in, you're in agreement aren't you <laughs> the two of you? Yeah yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking that, you know, we, we want to get this not just to sort of pockets of the country, but yeah, to, I agree. And actually, the more deprived parts of the country in particular. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so, so I'm sort of currently trying to look at a different, a slightly different model for doing it, which I'm very happy to discuss with you. Yeah. Uh, um, but as I say, I think, I think the first thing is that we need to emphasise that this issue needs to be taken super seriously. And I mean, that's why I've been pushing it with Catherine. You know, it needs to be taken super seriously. Absolutely. More money for more money for better qualified, or not better, it's the wrong word, sorry, but staff who are able to hold more of a leadership role and um, analyse analyze, uh, situations situations these are highly complex situations staff who've got good safeguarding training who've you know who, who are experienced who are who are able to notice what's going on 
Sure. Because don't forget in that cohort of families that I worked with, um, I don't want to say too much because I realise that this is recorded, but uh, there's, a, there's a difficulty with the current, uh, there's a difficulty in noticing what's happening. And I think maybe we need to look at having some access, great, easier access to psychologists or somebody who's able to notice. I mean, you know, some families who I had one hour with on a um, online thing, I never met them, had been working with existing services, including quite high level services, uh, sometimes for a year or two years without anybody realizing that what was going on in terms of mum's mental health or uh, dad's mental health or, you know, uh, et cetera. Anyway, I could go on, but I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm a bit no, limited by the fact well, this is recorded. I, I think, uh, but I agree with, I, I won't go on, but I agree with Jonathan, and there's a lot more to talk about here, that actually GPs do a lot of therapeutic work in their own right. And, uh, you know, I've been in both camps. I'm, a, I'm trained in psychotherapy, but also as a GP, worked many years. And actually, I, I, I personally think that we should be doing more to help um, GPs, you know, manage in a, in a compassionate and helpful way the, yeah. the patients, you know, rather than hiving off and creating this Cartesian split between mind and body, you know, really reinforcing it. Oh, this is mental. Off you go to IAPT. <laughs> I actually think, you know, GPs can do and could do a lot more and actually be much more happy in their work. Um, you, you know, that people talk of compassion fatigue, but compassion is actually a positive emotion. It's empathic distress fatigue that we're talking about and they're different. Um, yeah, anyway. I know. And the problem is, of course, uh, <laughs> I won't go on, but we could, uh, we could go on for yeah. so much longer on this. And just the fact that we've had such a good attendance and registration for this webinar, engagement with this webinar and the, and the amount of chat that's going on there. Um, I think, Johnny, if we take this back and think, can we explore this further? What, what we'll do is we will share the link to the recording and we'll share the chats and the, with all the resources in it to everybody who's registered for the, for the webinar. If people are interested in taking something forward on this, this topic, which is of interest to primary care and, and public health, coming at it from kind of two sides of the, the telescope, then please do email me or Johnny and we'll see, or Eleanor, and we'll see whether there's some interest and maybe we'll get a group together to, to, to look at what could we, what could we take forward between us? I and mean, even if it's just maybe a, um, a, a focused webinar series or whatever. So just let us know, because I do I sense there's an awful lot of interest here um, and what I'll, I'll kind of wind up now and people who do want to stay and have a bit of an update on the special interest group you're very welcome to stay but thank you so much to Sarah and to Jonathan it's been absolutely fascinating I mean I've I've learned stuff and I've had pennies dropping because this is all we're all familiar with this, aren't we? It's all familiar and we've all been thinking and worrying about it, but it's fine making sense of it. And the two of you have gone a, a, quite a way to help us make sense uh, of trauma and its consequences and, and how we work with it. So immensely grateful um, and thank you very much. So um, keep in touch, as I say, we'll send stuff out by email and you can all respond to that if you'd like to, if you want to take it further.